Let's see. My clicker. Yay, that's it. I have the exam, but I can't get my Mac yet. Not everybody. Done. Okay, so if you want a lab report, Oh. And Christina, I have um lab reports. Hang on. There's two though. All right, so attendance is open. Y'all can go ahead and do that. Why did you ask? No, like you told me how to do it, and then I still did it wrong, and now I'm looking at it, and I'm still not trying to how to do it. So ask me. So I'll be like, okay, we need to go over this <laughs> because, uh, yeah, you're gonna see it, but not right now, because I'm about to start. But not right now. But not right now. <laughs> but not right now. After class, do after class. Okay, and I'm screen sharing in my chat. I like my chat. I really like my chat. Why does it keep going away? It's because of this. It just doesn't like that. There we go. Weirdness. Okay, so we got to finish eight. Because remember, we didn't do the last two sections in eight. We did cancer and RAS. We did insulin. Here we go. Tumor necrosis. Boy, it's an empty class today, huh? It's Monday. Monday after a break. Monday after a break is tough. It is tough. Okay. Remember, your chapter eight homework's coming up, right? Because we're going to finish chapter eight today. So even though you probably should have done it before the exam, it is actually due this week. <laughs> All right. What time is it? Are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. Uh, I hope everybody had a good break. Maybe? Yeah. Okay. At least you had your exam before break and you weren't. Yeah. Studying this during all during your break, even though you should have been kind of like reading ahead. And... Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, what is a witch's favorite subject in school? Spelling. <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> what is Reef saying? It's not I have 12 people who said yes. 
keep trying. Like close it out completely, like swipe it up, get rid of it and try again. How much is the curve for the test? The curve for the test, I think was eight points. That sounds about right. <laughs> That's about right, okay, about eight points. All right, so we're gonna finish our signaling, right? We're almost done with signaling. So we have two last, the last two are our tumor necrosis factors. Why did that get so big? And our cast bases. So, um, and um, not in cast bases and uh, nuclear transcription factors. So 8.4 is all about tumor necrosis factor. What, do you, what does that sound like, tumor necrosis factor? What do we want to happen? We wanna kill tumor cells, right? So this is, this is a really good way for the body to monitor cells to make sure that they're functioning properly and that you can complete like a self-destruct sequence when they're not. So remember that this is the only receptor on the outside of the membrane that requires um, trimerization, right? What does that mean, trimerization? We need three of them, right? We need three of them. So we have a single receptor that is going to stimulate a, a mega pathway with two completely opposing cellular responses. So those competing responses are cell survival and cell death. You get one of the two. So if, if you want to control whether the cell is going to undergo apoptosis or not, what we need to worry about, I'm saying here that if this, this receptor is stimulated, there are two different things that could happen. Either it could survive or it could die. So it's not just about what happens on the outside surface of the cell, it's also about what's going on inside the cell. So what's the difference between having cell death and having cell survival? It's all about what's in the middle. So remember how we talked about you have all kinds of different adapter proteins that bind to the receptors that facilitate interaction with other downstream partners? Same thing happens here. And so if you undergo cell death, that means that you have a high level of what are called pro-apoptotic proteins. What is apoptosis? Program cell death, right? So if you have a lot of those adapter proteins that promote cell death, you're going to undergo a proteolytic cascade with your cast bases. And we'll talk about those in a second. But that means you have to have a low level of anti-apoptotic proteins, right? Anti-apoptotic prevents cell death. So here's the, the opposite of that, right? Where we have a low, low, low level of pro-apoptotic and a high level of anti-apoptotic. So in this case, the cell is gonna survive. So it depends on two things, receptor activation, and the concentration of these pro and anti-apoptotic adapter proteins, right? It's not just one, kind of like what we talked about before. All right, so our receptor, our tumor necrosis factor receptor is a homotrimer. Homo meaning that they are all three the same and that it requires three. So just like all of our other receptors, what this was one of those questions on the exam, what is this, what is in common with all of the receptors that we've talked about so far? Every time our ligand binds, what happens? We have a conformational change. Now, that conformational change can result in many different things happening. Sometimes it promotes the catalytic activity of the receptor itself, right? Then it can go and phosphorylate things. Sometimes it's just a conformational change that initiates a disassociation of it, right? In this case, this conformational change is going to change at a particular part of the receptor called the death domain. It's a really great topic for Monday, right? Okay, so at the death domain, what's going to happen is that when that tumor necrosis factor, that little ligand binds to the receptor, we're gonna have that conformational change and that conformational change is going to cause a change in the silence of the death domain protein. <laughs> what do you think that, the, that 
that this does, the silence of the deaf domain, I could write. So this is an inhibitory, right? And I N I N H I B I T O R inhibitory um, function, right? Silencing inhibition, right? All those things are the same. So we have an inhibitory protein that will bind at the death domain. So the death domain is on the tumor necrosis factor receptor. Within the death domain, we have a silencing of death domain area. So inhibitory proteins can bind at this silencing point and prevent it from further signaling, right? Okay. So let's look at a picture. It's kind of better with a picture, right? Here's our tumor necrosis factor. And here at the bottom of the receptor are the death domains. So down here, you have areas where the silencing of death domain protein will bind to the silencing of death domain locations on the receptor, right? So once TNF alpha binds, now what happens to the silencing of death domain protein, the pink one. Notice this is unbound. Unbound, our silencing protein is there. Now, TNF alpha binds. We have a conformational change. They don't show it. That's horrible and terrible. They don't show it, but there is a conformational change. They didn't do everything right. So in the yellow, there's not, they're not showing a conformational change, but there is one. You understand what I'm saying? Well, if they could color them differently, they could do something different, but, but it changes when TNF alpha binds. So now, do we still have these pink silencing of death domain proteins attached to the death domain? No, right? So when we, this is our bound state, bound TNF alpha, when that binds, our silencing of death domain can't bind anymore, right? So now we have an alternative protein that's gonna bind to our receptor. This alternative protein that's going to bind is gonna have a completely different function. So our um, silencing of death domain proteins, right? These are inhibitory. So these are inhibitory, right? So what do you think, is this, are these proteins gonna be inhibitory? No, they're gonna be stimulatory, right? So what do we want to stimulate? What do we want? Downstream signaling to occur. So basically our silencing of death domain are basically like caps that just prevent association of other things with the death domain. And when TNF alpha binds, those caps are released and now really the signaling molecules can bind to the receptor. And those signaling molecules are the TRADD. We're gonna talk about those. So what's the whole point, right? of activating our tumor necrosis factor. If we've activated it, we, we want downstream signaling. What do we want our cells to do eventually? We want them to die eventually. And that's a good thing. It's actually a good thing, right? We, we want cancer cells to die. Most of them do, not all of them, but most of them. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, it's going to trigger what's called a caspase cascade. Have y'all heard of caspases in other classes? Anybody? Yeah. A few? So caspases are, once they're activated, um, they are proteins that will go in and cleave other things and initiate the beginning steps of cell death, okay? So in order to have this happen, but only at particular times, we have to have a mechanism that keeps this shut off unless we instantly want the cell to die. 
So how can we do that without having cast bases going around and cleaving everything in sight? Do you remember when we talked about enzymes needing to be proteolytically cleaved before they can become active? Remember those zymogens? It's very similar to the zymogens. So you have what are called pro-cast bases. When the pro-cast bases are activated, then you have a cast base. So cast bases are um, enzymes that will go in and cut up proteins. They cut up proteins that have cysteine and aspartate. So they have to have that, those two residues next door to one another. And then it can go and chew up just basically anything. Okay, so when we have those activating proteins that are associating with the TNF alpha receptor, the first thing that happens is we have a procaspase. So our first one is procaspase eight. They were numbered by how they were discovered, not by their function, which is annoying, right? So we cleave it. When it gets cleaved, now we have active caspase eight. So this is active, this is inactive. And we called it a cascade, right? So we're gonna have to have some more sequences in here. So now that caspase eight is active, it will actually go in and cleave procaspase three. Procaspase three is the inactive form into caspase three. They call caspase three the executioner caspase because it's the one that really goes in and chews up the cellular proteins. And then once you have those, those cellular proteins that are essential for life inside of the cell, those are degraded, the cell dies. That's it, game over, right? Okay, so let's, let's talk about this for a second. So why do you want to have a mechanism where you can have both cell survival and cell death controlled by the same receptor? Why would you want that? Right, TNF, that's what I just said, TNF alpha. If you activate it, you can either activate cell survival or cell death. So why do we want that kind of a pathway inside of the cell? What's the benefit? Because we've, we've talked about not having that feudal cycling going on in the cell. Like, you know, if your blood sugar gets high, we want to promote taking in the glucose, using the glucose to make ATP, and we want to suppress making, um, uh, breaking down glycogen, right? So that you could increase your blood sugar. Well, that would be pointless, right? So why do we want in the same cell with the same receptor, two simultaneously different outcomes to be possible, right? Because it just depends on what's inside the cell. Are those pro-apoptotic? Are those anti-apoptotic proteins around? Why is that a good thing? How quickly do you want the cell to die? You want it to be extremely quick because the longer a cancer cell hangs out inside of the cell, inside of the body, the more likely it is to evade the body's natural um, mechanisms to get rid of it, right? So basically what this gives us, this, um, let me go back here. This gives us a toggle switch. A very, very rapid on off because environmental changes occur very quickly. And so it's important to be able to kill the cell very quickly, to have it survival, 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 I need to die right? Because you don't want those um, tumor cells to survive. Then you get cancer and then you die, your whole body dies. So it's much preferable to sacrifice one cell versus the entire organism. 
Make sense? Okay, your book goes into way more detail, way more detail than this. This is all you need for me, okay? Because if you wanna know about it, you'll take cell biology and you'll learn all about it there. Okay, so the last kind of um, cellular communication that occurs, occurs actually in the nucleus, right? Everything we've talked about so far, where are those receptors? on the outside membrane of the cell, right? Well, there are some molecules that can pass directly through the membrane. So they can get through basically any membrane. So they're gonna get through the outer cell membrane. They're gonna get through the nuclear envelope, right? So we have receptors that are sitting waiting inside of the nucleus. And we can call them nuclear receptors, intracellular receptors. What else do we call them? So nuclear receptors, intracellular receptors. What else? I alluded to this. What was that? Transcription factors. Because what's in the nucleus? DNA. DNA. So nuclear receptors is the same thing as transcription factors, right? So these are not bound to the nuclear membrane. They float around, right? And so they regulate gene expression. They are going to determine how much and how quickly those genes are transcribed. So they have two major classifications, steroid receptors and metabolite receptors. What are steroid receptors? What do you think? Give me some examples. This is one we talked about, estrogen, right? Um, we'll just say androgens. Testosterone is one of them. What else? What's that? Uh, no, that's the outside. That's the outside, right? Remember we talked about that. What? So these are all cholesterol derivatives. C-H-O. Derivatives, D-E-R-I-T-I-V-E-S, something like that. They're, they're all have that basic steroid nucleus, right? And so they, they have those similar things. Um, glucocorticoids, we'll talk about some of those. Those are just some examples. Um, and metabolite receptors. Um, <clears throat> what do we think about metabolite receptors? Things, think about things that we eat that aren't glucose, right? Because we talked about glucose. Glucose is different. Vitamins, right? Um, sometimes amino acids, some um, free unsaturated fatty acids, things like that. Okay, so these are our two main groups. I said it and then didn't write it. Okay, so how, how are they regulated, right? They're, they're all the way in the nucleus. How are they regulated? Well, remember how we said every cell has the same DNA, it has the same recipe book, it has the same cookbook, but <clears throat> each cell uses a different recipe, right? So not every cell is going to express the same transcription factors. So that's part of it. How available are the ligands, right? What did you eat will control how your transcription factors respond or what did your, what hormone did your brain produce, right? That will control it. And then accessibility of our target DNA. How do we control accessibility? We talked about this. Condensation, how, how condensed our DNA is. Is it heterochromatin? Is it euchromatin, right? So if it's very, very condensed, even if you have a ton of transcription factors present, are you going to be able to access the site on the DNA? Nope, doesn't matter. If it's super unwound, Maybe you won't need so many transcription factors in order to get the same effect. 
right? So you have to think about all the different things that, that will control um, our, our receptors. So here are some examples of um, transcription factors um, that bind to the DNA. So we said there are two major types, right? There are the steroid receptors and the metabolite receptors. They look different and they interact with the DNA differently. So we talked about some of the examples of the steroid receptors, right? But look at the difference between the two groups. Do you see how in a steroid receptor, we bind in exactly the same position, except the second one is inverted. So this is what's called a head-to-head, head head-to-head head interaction. Whereas this one, if this is the head, this must be the tail. So this is a head-to-tail interaction. You see the difference? So if the larger portion is the head, this is head-to-head. This is head to tail. So this is important. It really is important because it means that these transcription factors interact with the DNA in a different way. If you are going to facilitate a head to head interaction, and I'm telling you that this is the sequence that our protein will bind to, our transcription factor will bind to, A, G, A, A, C, A. What is going to happen in order for a homodimer in a reverse position to bind to the DNA, right? Because basically you have on, it's like your hands, right? Instead of having two sit down on the DNA like this, they have to sit down like this, right? So if I tell you the sequence for this one, what do I need to have to make this work? It's the same sequence, but it needs to be reversed, right? So if you look, the, these are called inverted repeat DNA sequences. I need A, G, A, A, C, A, right? So here it is on the bottom, A, G, A, A, C, A, but it goes in reverse. It goes A, C, A, A, G, A. So here's one binding site. Here's the other binding site. So you can look in the DNA and you can actually search and find these places. And each one of the receptors will have a unique DNA sequence that it binds to. And you gotta think there's also gotta be a little bit of a gap. So usually there's about three nucleotides in between. So it doesn't have to be a receptor strain like that? Well, gotta think about DNA is not linear, right. right? It coils. And so in order for it to bind, it's going to have to sit in the major groove of the DNA. And so it's actually going to bind to the complementary. One will bind to one strand, one will bind to the complementary strand. So I don't really like the way that they did it there because it looks like this one is binding to this, but it's not. Yeah. Okay. So in our other case where we have metabolite receptors, metabolite receptors are binding in that head to tail fashion. So in these, these are going to be direct repeat DNA sequences. So in this one, I'm going to bind A, G, G, T, C, A. Well, what am I going to bind here? Exactly the same thing. So those are my two binding sites. Yes? Um, is the weakened binding site always going to be on the head or can it be on the tail as well? Most of the time it's on the head. Okay. There are very, very rare cases where it's on the tail. Okay. Most of the time it's going to be on the head. Um, so in, in steroid receptors, usually these two are unique and unique to the different ligands that they're going to bind to. What's different about a metabolite receptor is that usually one of them is unique. The green one would be unique. And then the purple one is the same for a lot of them, not for all of them, but for a lot of them. It's the retinoid X receptor. So see how this one's labeled RXR? It's always going to be an RXR, not always. I should never say always, ever. <laughs> it's usually an RXR and then something else, right? Depending on, are you binding vitamin D? Are you binding whatever hormone, whatever you're binding, right? It's going to be something unique. 
So if we look at these, um, you have to remember that for these ligands to get in, right, they have to be able to pass through the membranes. So if they're able to pass through the membranes, we a lot of times call them lipophilic, right? So being able to be dissolved by lipids so it can pass through. So because of that property, they are able to get to the transcription factor. Now, just because they can get to the transcription factor does not mean that these transcription factors are actually bound to the DNA. They can be off the DNA or they can be on the DNA, either one, right? So it can occur with or without DNA present. Binding of the ligand to the receptor is independent of binding of the transcription factor to the DNA, okay? So what happens is that this transcription factor, now that it is bound to the ligand, it is going to recruit what are called co-regulatory proteins. Co-regulatory proteins can then directly change the DNA. And a lot of times this is through acetylation and deacetylation. So DNA that is acetylated is basically transcribed. Deacetylated ends up not being transcribed. So this is silenced, silenced DNA. Generally, not always, but generally. Okay, so what, and I don't like that they, they kind of missed this too. When a ligand binds, why are we now able to recruit co-regulatory proteins? They like totally skipped over this. Conformational changes, absolutely conformational changes. And they don't show this here. And I guess they kind of do when they kind of separate. I guess they kind of do, but I think it should be clearer than that. But anyway, you have to have conformational changes to occur to then promote that secondary binding of our co-regulatory proteins. And then the co-regulatory proteins actually have the activity to change the DNA. But what DNA do they change? Only the DNA that the transcription factor can bind to. Right? Okay, so we kind of said this, right? Our steroid receptors are head-to-head -head homodimers. They bind those inverted repeat DNA sequences, right? So if this is if this is site one, so let's call this site one, how do I know what site two should be? Site two. So how do I how do I do that? So you got it, you have to write it. You have to write it five prime to three prime. You have to. So my suggestion is to write the complement. So what's the complement? GT, right? So this is now three prime to five prime. So then you have some kind of a gap here that's a certain number of nucleotides, whatever it is. So now what you want to do is go, if it is the inverted repeat, take what's here and put it here. So T, G, T, T, C, T. Ooh, I'm running out of room there. Now complement it. A, C, A, A, G, A. This is three prime to five prime. So now we have site one, site two, right? They're the inverted repeats of one another, okay? And we already talked about the ligands being cholesterol derivatives. Yeah? So far so good? Okay. All right, and then our metabolite receptors, we said were head to tail and they bind to direct DNA sequences, right? Okay, and we said what they're derived from. Okay, so why is this important? Well, I wanna give you one example as to why this is important. So glucocorticoid signaling is super important in the cell. Um, we need it for a bunch of different things. Lung development's one of them, carbohydrate metabolism is one of them, but the inflammatory response, that's the one I wanna talk about. So if we have our receptor, the receptor can either be 
inside of the cytosol or it can be inside the nucleus. There are nuclear pores and they can kind of come and go. So in this case, this one kind of hangs out in the cytosol until it binds to the glucocorticoids, then it is relocated to the nucleus. So once it's activated, it recruits all kinds of accessory proteins, right? Which then increases expression of certain genes. In this case, it's the annexin one gene. This gene product will reduce inflammation. At the same time, other transcription factors that have that same ligand bound will also bind what's called P65. P65 is actually something that will promote transcription of um, P50. Um, and so P50 will con control another gene. And this gene, if we decrease its expression, results in the same thing, reduced inflammation. This is a wonderful therapeutic target. Where can you think of ideas where you want to reduce inflammation? What's that? Arthritis is a great one, right? What if we can make a ligand that mimics our glutocorticoid, but has a higher affinity to the receptor? Right, didn't we talk about this? What do we call those? Not antagonists, but agonists, agonists. So if we have an agonist that will bind with a tighter affinity, right? We can stimulate this process all the time, not all the time, but whenever you take the medication. So um, arthritis is one of them. That's a great thing. But what happens when you take arthritis medicine? Have you heard these commercials? <laughs> for arthritis medications where they're like, oh, take this, you know, and this, this old person who's like doing all kinds of fun things with their grandkids, right? And, and then comes the little, the, 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 I'll call that the small print, right? But they say, and you have an increased risk of, and it was like tuberculosis infection, cancer, you know, like all this kind of stuff. Why? If I decrease my inflammatory response, what happens? What are you supposed to do when you get a tuberculosis infection? You're supposed to have an immune response. If you don't have an immune response, that means your immune system is not responding. Why do you have an increased risk of cancer? Because your immune system is not recognizing and having the appropriate response to cancers, right? So they can be really good. They can be helpful, but you have to be careful, right? What's another, place where we would like an agonist here. Asthma, right? You know, if anybody has asthma, they have an inhaler, right? What are they inhaling? A glucocorticoid agonist, <laughs> right? They're actually developing, um, it's called dextamethasone. So this is a drug um, that is an agonist and it binds 50x what our normal glucocorticoids will bind and they're using it to treat COVID patients, right? Because do you, have you heard about the, the, the cascade event that occurs in COVID patients? No, it's like an immunological cascade. So basically the immune system goes crazy and you're supposed to have an immune response to an infection, absolutely. But in COVID patients, for some reason, um, what they are seeing is an elevated inflammatory response. So much so that you're causing damage to the cells all around you. It's like bystander, what do they call that? Um, so terrible. Um, Off-target bystander effects, right? So you're having too much of a response. Well, if you're having too much of a response, what can we do? We can give you an agonist and we can prevent that from happening, right? So, so it's, a, it's a huge um, therapeutic target. And 50X is insanely great. Um, the ones that are used to treat um, joint inflammation with arthritis is like 10X. So 50X is, is pretty awesome, pretty amazing, right? Okay, let's see. Oh, let me ask you this. Um, 
if we're going to treat somebody with a steroid, right, with, with an agonist that is going to mimic something like a glucocorticoid, how would that be different than taking perhaps aspirin or ibuprofen that inhibits those COX? Remember, we talked about, no, that wasn't this class. Is that this class? No, that was not this class. We talked about other things. But like if you take ibuprofen or aspirin, it's going to reduce inflammation, right? But how quickly does that wear off? Four to six hours and you're done, right? What if you take a steroid? How long does that last? That's a tricky question because a lot of times it doesn't happen very quickly. An inhaled steroid does. That's, it's slightly, it's a different delivery mechanism. But if I take a pill that's a that's a agonist to a glucocorticoid, it's going to take a little bit of time for me to see an effect, but it will be a long lasting effect. Why is that? These are steroid derivative drugs. They are super stable. So their turnover rate is very low. So they're going to hang out in the body for a long time, even when you stop taking the medicine, right? So if you stop taking um, a steroid, usually what they do is they gradually wean you off of it. You heard that? Like if you have, if you have asthma, they prescribe you an inhaler and they also give you the little pack of um, tablets. And they say like, if you're having a really, really severe attack, they tell you to take, I don't know how many it is. And then each day you take one less so that it gradually weans your body off of it. Yeah, but that's an antibiotic. But that's an antibiotic. A Z-Pax an antibiotic. So you take a like very high dose antibiotic, and then you wean down the amount of antibiotic you take. It's a similar thing, similar but but different. But um, but so it's, it's anything that's a steroid derivative is highly stable um, and takes a while for your body to clear, right? So, and then the other thing that helps with that is these transcription factors hang out, right? So they're proteins, they're sitting inside of the nucleus. What's their turnover rate compared to a turnover rate of a receptor in the nucleus, in the membrane, in the outer membrane? Outer membrane gets recycled really quickly, right? Not so much in the nucleus. And you gotta think about, okay, that transcription factor is gonna change transcription. Then what else do you have to go through? Then I have to make the RNA, I have to process the RNA, I have to turn the RNA into protein, then the protein's got to go do its function. So these things take time. So it takes time for your steroid to start working. But once it starts working, that protein's hanging out in the cell a long time, the steroid's hanging out in the cell a long time. And so it takes a while for your body to um, go back to your baseline levels without it, right? So it's kind of cool. I thought that was interesting for y'all. Okay, now we got to change gears. Escape would help. Okay. Y'all ready to change gears? Now comes the fun stuff. But I opened this. What? Like color things. Yay! All right. So, like, up until this point, it's been like the biochemistry basics. But now we finally get into how all of it incorporates together and we start understanding how an entire organism works, which is insanely awesome. So we're going to talk generally about metabolism. And then all these things are very specific to glycolysis. So I've kind of heard y'all don't do sugars in organic chem. Not really. All right. So last semester, I didn't know that. And I kind of like went quick and um, it was not good. So we're going to spend some time on it and make sure. Y'all know um, the book is kind of written to where it assumes that you know how sugars work. So we'll spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, and then we'll talk about how glycolysis basically works, which is so, so cool. So when we talk about metabolism, right? Metabolism is every different biochemical reaction that occurs inside of a living organism. And it's all about converting chemical energy into work. Right? So chemical energy is stored in the things that we eat and we use that to make things, right? So we have to have catabolic and anabolic pathways, right? So what's catabolic? 
metabolize, break down, anabolic, build up. So you have to remember that both things are happening in every single cell all the time. You don't just have catabolic in this cell and anabolic in that cell. Both are happening all the time. So when we talk about catabolic pathways, we are degrading pretty big things, macromolecules and nutrients that we eat to steal the energy from those molecules. And we're going to put that energy into carrier molecules. And we call these carrier molecules NADH and FADH2. So you're gonna get really familiar with those. Then we have anabolic pathways that use the energy that we generated. And eventually these carrier molecules will go on and will make ATP from that, from that energy. And so we'll use that ATP that we've made and we'll hydrolyze it and we'll oxidize things like NADPH to synthesize big biomolecules. So generally, what are we doing? What, what kinds of reactions are we doing here? We're doing redox. It's all redox, all of it, okay? So when we talk about flux inside of the cell, right? You have to remember that metabolites are gonna be used in multiple different pathways, right? One metabolite can be used in both synthesis and degradation. And so you have to see basically what substrates are around that are gonna control whether you're gonna go through the anabolic or the catabolic pathways. So if we just take glucose, for example, because we're gonna cover glycolysis, right? Let's say A is first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. Tell me about glucose in your blood first thing in the morning. You just woke up. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna embrace it. I'm gonna say I have low blood sugar, right? <laughs> So I have low blood sugar. That's not so red hot. My brain likes glucose. So what is my body going to do? I have glycogen. I've stored glycogen. I am gonna degrade glycogen and I'm gonna make glucose. So what kind of a pathway is that? Anabolic or catabolic? Catabolic, okay. The other way that I can get glucose is that I can start with pyruvate. And there are different sources for pyruvate. We'll talk about that. I can go through a process called gluconeogenesis. What does that word mean to you? Gluconeogenesis. Glucose production, right? We're going to make it. So both pathways are going to produce glucose then we're going to export it into the bloodstream and the brain can use it, right? So what do I wanna do with my other pathways that are actually going to get rid of glucose? I wanna inhibit them, right? So I suppress those and I promote the ones that give me glucose in my bloodstream. When I go through gluconeogenesis, anabolic, catabolic, You're making something. So you're what? So you're anabolic. So I did both catabolic and anabolic in order to increase my blood sugar, right? So both things are happening at the same time in the same cell. What if I have situation B? Situation B is after breakfast. Tell me about my blood after breakfast, right after breakfast. I've got high blood sugar, high BS. All right, so what's gonna happen? I had this influx of glucose. What am I gonna do with that glucose? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two things with it. The first thing that I'm gonna take care of before I store anything is I'm going to produce ATP from it, right? So I made insulin, which told all my cells to take in glucose. Now, what do you do with that glucose that you took in? So I'm gonna go through glycolysis. So here's glucose, I'm gonna go through glycolysis. 
I'm gonna make pyruvate. Eventually, after a ton of steps, I'm gonna make ATP, right? So that's gonna satisfy my energy charge for the cell. But what if I have excess glucose? Now what can I do with it? I can make storage molecule, which is glycogen. So I can go through a synthesis for glycogen and I can store glycogen. So I just went through glycolysis, which is what kind of a pathway? Catabolic. And I can also go through glycogen storage, which is a synthesis or a anabolic pathway. So both catabolic and anabolic occur at the same time. You want to pick one or the other, but it's not one or the other. All right. So we have these different situations. What controls what my body will do? Two primary factors. My level of enzyme activity, remember this, and the availability of my substrates. That sounds really simple, but let's take these and kind of break them down. This is a good review for all the stuff we did in the past. What controls my level of enzyme activity? Y'all look at me like, no, don't make me remember all this. Let's start from the beginning. If it's an enzyme, it's a protein, so we had to code for it in the DNA. So what's the first thing that can control it? Gene expression, transcription. Okay, then what? Converting from RNA to protein. So we call that translation. And that's all the steps from RNA to protein. There are many, right? There are many. Now what? We've made it. What controls how long it's there? What? Well, turnover. Bioavailability in general, yes, but I'm looking for more specifics. So this would be protein turnover. Right? How quickly it's degraded. We made it. Now, how long does it stick around? Now, of the protein that's made and that's there, what do we, what do we say for how well it does its job? Catalytic activity. Okay, now let's say it's made, it's working very efficiently, but it's not in the right place. It's another way we can control it, right? So that would be cellular, cellular location, right? Location, location, location. Okay, now, how do we regulate catalytic activity? There are two main ways. It's really important because, because catalytic activity is super important in regulation of glycolysis and every other pathway. Uh, no. That's like, that's like how an enzyme works, how specific it is, how tightly it binds, that kind of stuff. How do we regulate an enzyme's activity? How do we regulate it? Post translational modifications. What's the most common? So plus or minus a, phos a phosphate group, right? What's the other one? Binding of regulatory molecules. This is super important. We are going to use this. Do not forget this. Do not forget this. Okay, so make sure you have that. Okay, so then the other question is, how do we determine bioavailability? Well, think about what was our bioavailability here for glucose? 
did we eat or not, right? So what is that controlled by? That's controlled by our diet. So that's part of it, right? Okay, so what about the other way? You can get glycogen not only, you can get glucose not only from what you eat, but you can also get from how you store it, right? So, so the other part, part of it is what you eat and part of it is, um, uh, we'll say substrates released from, we'll say body. Because it's not just glucose, it's many different substrates, but those are the two different ways. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to totally freak you out. I'm going to totally freak you out. These are the different metabolic pathways in plants and animals. <laughs> you will not be memorizing them. But what's important to understand is that they are super dependent upon one another. Does this look like independent pathways to you? And they're all connected. They're all connected. Yes, they're all connected. So how do we control if you're going through pathway X or pathway Y? Enzyme activity levels and substrate bioavailability. That's the two things we already talked about, right? So all of these pathways are using shared intermediates and they're dependent upon one another and how much of this substrate is used in this pathway versus that pathway, right? This is really hard to learn like this. So we're not gonna learn it this way. We're gonna learn it one at a time, but it's important that you understand that the pathways are not isolated that they are, it's, it's the, can you see the forest in the trees? You know what I mean? Like if you're in the forest, you can basically look at one tree, but is that the only tree in the forest? No, the forest is big. <laughs> okay, so I, you don't have to memorize this. I'm not really trying to freak you out. This is the simplified version that we're gonna learn. And we're not even gonna learn the whole thing, <laughs> but, what you have to kind of focus on are we have four different um, macromolecules, right? These are our four macromolecules. Remember this from like chapter one? Was it chapter one or chapter two? I don't remember. It was very, very early, right? It was one, right? Proteins, nucleic acids, carbs, and lipids. So each of these things can be made and can be degraded, right? You see the double-sided arrows? Gosh, there are lots and lots of double-sided arrows, right? <laughs> so inside of these different interconnected pathways, we have lots of primary metabolites. The primary metabolites are the blue things, right? So these are the blue boxes. And these primary metabolites are shared. I was gonna write shared, but it has it right there. They're shared. So depending on the environmental conditions of the cell are gonna tell you which pathway we're gonna go through. It's not, it's not that you can only do this pathway if you have this substrate. It's all very, very, very connected. And then you have seven small biomolecules, seven small biomolecules that are going to be involved in these pathways, right? And these are the ones that are highlighted in red. Okay. So if we take this map that we have here and we classify this map into two different basic ideas in that we have energy conversion and then we have synthesis and degradation pathways. So what's the point of energy conversion? Right, the energy is still there. It hasn't changed. It hasn't, it has changed, but 
it's still the energy that was available in glucose is converted to the energy that's available in ATP, right? So these are gonna be redox reactions that are gonna occur in order for us to get usable energy. Then you have pathways that are synthesis and degradation. And so what we're gonna focus on for the rest of the year are these energy conversion pathways. So of all that stuff, we're gonna focus on the red. So even more narrowed down, okay? So um, if you take Biochem 2, which I highly, highly recommend you take Biochem 2, if you're pre-med, if you love biochemistry the way I love biochemistry, which y'all are giving me eyes, and I don't think it's possible. But um, if you're, if you're pre-med, pre-pharmacy, pre those kinds of things, I highly, highly recommend it. But anyway, I think I'm running out of time. And the other thing I wanted to tell y'all, I was told to tell y'all about a seminar on Friday. Did y'all know about this? Can I pull it up? Let's see. Oh, no, I didn't put it on here. I'll put it on next time. I'll remind y'all. But it's a, it's a doctor who's coming to talk about how to be successful in med school. So I think it's on Friday at like 2.30. I don't remember what room, but I'll pull it up next time. All right. Too bad we have Yeah, I know. Ask them if they're going to record it on Zoom. Okay, hold on. Anybody? Oh, I can check that. You too. All right, let's see. Anybody need anything? We're going to end this.